The Apostle John wrote about a savage persecution that tore apart God's church in the first century, but he never concluded his third epistle. The non-conclusion of 3 John exposes that the attack on God's church didn't end in the first century. Learn how this attack rages in full force today, next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. There are three New Testament books that have no conclusions or no amen at the end of their, their books. And uh, those three books are the uh, book of Acts and the book of James and the uh, book of John's third epistle. So this third epistle of John has no conclusion. No amen at the end of it. So, what is that all about? And if we can really dig into these subjects like this, you'll find that even the omitting a conclusion is a message from God in itself. And you gain more depth into what God wants to teach us if we explore those no amens, we could say. Last week I spoke to you about the lost century from 70 A.D. to 170 A.D., and, and uh, that history was just blotted out of secular history. You can't find it. But of course God realized that and gave that history to us in the epistles of John. So when they went into that 100-year period. They had the message of Christ, and then when they came out, they had a message about the person of Christ. And that Babylonian mystery religion had just added the name of Christianity, and quote unquote, and utterly, it was utterly unlike anything that Christ taught. And and was covered in the beginning of that 100-year period, so it was a well-organized conspiracy. But this book has no ending, and what is it all about? The 70 A.D. to 170 A.D. conspiracy is only the beginning, just the beginning of a massive conspiracy to attack God's church and destroy it. And you can read even in Revelation 12 and verse 9. We're going to go there and explain all of this, and in in Revelation. But it, the whole world is deceived, and that this this conspiracy has a lot to do with that. So what we're trying to do is to give you the the whole picture here of what what God wants us to get. And John wasn't really equipped to do that in his third epistle, so he just ended it with no amen, no no conclusion. And God wanted him to have a greater context than just that third epistle of John, or even all of the epistles for that matter. But here you have. The last two eras of God's church discussed here, and and what is happening to those two eras, and and again you get into that godly depth of what is what is going on in in God's mind. This is not about a, a man's mind; it's about the mind of God and what is He doing and why. Why is it being uh, structured the way it is? That's something to be concerned about. So the uh, no amen message is also very very critical. God did not want John to reveal that 100-year conspiracy in the third epistle of John. Now he wanted to put it in a greater context, and that is, he wanted John to put it in his book on Revelation, which is a a book that. Gives you a time frame or a time sequence of all prophecy, and it's the only book in the Bible that does that. So John had to put it in specifically 
in Revelation 17. We'll go there, and I'll show you what I mean when we get there. But that's a, the let's say the specific context that explains what this conspiracy is all about, and it is for now, today, this very moment. It's being fulfilled before your eyes, and the epistles of John were for this end time in prophecy primarily, but Revelation is, of course, all. Prophecy and puts prophecy in a certain sequence where you can tell where you are in in uh, prophecy. But here we need an explanation of what this conspiracy is all about, and Revelation 17 really does give you that, and it's about what's happening right now in this end time, and I'd say primarily in the last era of God's church, and in the last head of the Holy Roman Empire. So that lost century plagues the Church from the very beginning of that lost century right on down to the Second Coming of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing context of prophecy, and you need all of Revelation, frankly, to fully understand it. And then if you want to go even further than that, it takes Daniel to unlock the book of Revelation. So there's a lot to learn here, but the lost century is only the beginning, only the beginning of this massive conspiracy against God's church. So let's take a look at 3 John verses 9 and 10. I'll read this. I read it to you last week, but I'll Give you a little bit of that history. So it all begins in this uh, third epistle of John, and verse 9 says, There's only uh, one chapter. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbid them. He forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church. Now this is an Antiochus that's doing this. And you will see, like in our booklet on the new throne of David, that Antiochus is Satan-possessed. It's a very, very frightening situation. And then let's go on down, though, and see where that conclusion is omitted. Verse 13. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you. Not with ink and pen. <laughs> See, in other words, I'm not going to write this, all of this to you in, in uh, these epistles. I'm going to do it, put, it, put it another place. And maybe God hadn't exactly shown him at this time about what, what he was going to do later in Revelation, or maybe he had. We just don't know. But then it concludes, verse 14, But I trust I shall shortly see you, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to you. Our friends salute you. Greet the friends by name. And that's the end of it. No amen, no conclusion, because there's more to this book, and it's going to be added by God's very elect before everything is said and done. There's more to it in 3 John, and God is going to see to it that it is added there by the very elect who talked about this today and the people that really understand it. So it's a fascinating concept here that we're talking about. What were these many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you at this time? No pen or ink here. So what is happening here? He has covered the 100-year history, but that was the purpose of the epistles. But they weren't, God wasn't going to take it further than that, because this was only the beginning of that massive conspiracy that ends at the very second coming of Jesus Christ Himself. I mean, it just leads directly into it, and we need to certainly be aware of that. There were just many things that John 
could have written. Well, actually, I think he did understand most of what he was going to write, according to these verses. So I guess we have to look at it that way. But anyhow, he didn't want to reveal the conspiracy and in the epistles of John, and especially in Third John, and it would have revealed that conspiracy. I think in a structure that would not have been adequate. And also, it it brings out in Revelation 17 the very city that he's talking about here. So God really gives us a lot of information, and He wants us to look into Revelation 17 and see what this is all about. So the same apostle John that wrote the Gospel of John and also the Book of Revelation is the one that wrote the epistles and Third John. And uh, that, that Amen just signifies the end of the chapter, but there's no Amen uh, after the last verse of Third John. There's uh, one verse in Revelation 17 that really covers the, all the history of the end time, if you want to know about the Holy Roman Empire. And if you want to know about the last two eras of God's true church, notice Revelation 17 and verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the others not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. So, what is this all about? Here you have the time when one is. Now, there was a minister in the Worldwide Church of God. The Herbert Armstrongs founded that church, and he said that Mr. Armstrong uncovered this prophecy. But that's not true at all. Mr. Armstrong didn't uncover anything, and men can't uncover this prophecy or even any of the truth of God. Really, they can't. They can't. Understand it, unless God reveals it to them. That's why there there's so much deception in this world. Men try to figure it out themselves, and they can never do that. God has to reveal it to us. So the one is, it says here in verse ten, the one is that is the the sixth head of the Holy Roman Empire, and God is telling us, well, there had to be an apostle or a prophet sent at the same time to explain all of that, because this is a huge part of this great conspiracy. This is what it's about. It's about all of it, really, right here. So uh, this, is the, this is what God wants us to understand. So. Uh, we can get a clear understanding out of this, but that minister was really not understanding this this history, even though he had the history down pretty good. He didn't really get the most important part of it, and he did because he didn't bring God into the picture. It's God who uncovers and reveals all this to us. That is critical to understand. See again, Revelation puts. All prophecies in a time sequence or a time frame, so we can understand where they are in the history of man and beyond that. So this is a a momentous event that's unfolding, and it takes really all of Revelation to to make you understand that in detail. But you can get the gist of it in Revelation 17, and that's that's where the uh, it's it's really focused right in on that conspiracy. These verses are really very revealing. But again, when you take that verse 10, you you think, well, okay, uh, Mr. Armstrong did fulfill a role there, a type of Elijah. It's Made very clear, Matthew 17 verses 10 and 11, Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6, Malachi 3 verses 1 and 2. There, God said there would be an end time Elijah who would restore all things. Everything had been lost after the first century. Amazing, but that's the truth of your Bible. 
just telling us that God has to do all of this. And so this is a very pivotal time in the history of God's church and of the Holy Roman Empire. One is, and then it says, one is yet to come. Well, after Mr. Armstrong died, okay, now we're in the uh, seventh era of God's church and the, the, the uh, seventh head of the Holy Roman Empire. No, you can, well, you can read Revelation 1 and verse 1. I don't need to go there, but God, you see, it says, gave this to Christ. God the Father gave it to Christ. And Christ gave it to an angel, an angel gave it to uh, John, and so on. But you see, Christ doesn't even know the day or the hour that He's going to return, but the Father does. So the Father knows all this about prophecy, and He's the one that gave the book of Revelation to us. Revelation 17, verse 7 says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. There's seven heads and ten horns in this Holy Roman Empire. And those ten horns, uh, in this case, are the ten kings that are in the very end of that last head. And it, it's all, again, what, what John was talking about in 3 John is being fulfilled now before our eyes. It's for today. That's the dramatic and wonderful truth that God reveals to us through putting this all together and realizing what it means to omit the, uh, the Amen. Ten kings. We have been prophesying this for over 75 years, that there would be ten kings in that Holy Roman Empire. It's going to be pared down quite a lot from what it is right now. But your Bible says there will be ten kings, and we can absolutely rely on God. Then on down in verse 10, I'll read that again. And there are seven kings, seven kings total. Five are fallen, already gone. And when uh, Herbert Armstrong came on the scene, and one is, and then God had him here explaining all this to us, and he knew all about Bible prophecy. He had to lay the whole foundation for us. And the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space, just a very short space. See here, here John wrote this a little later after the epistles, but then it wasn't to be fulfilled until this very end time right now as I speak to you. And it's all being fulfilled. In fact, 90% of the uh, Bible is being fulfilled today in these last two eras. So we, we need to keep that in mind as well. But it's the same conspiracy that we were talking about at the very beginning. And we're, see, we're, the other has come. See, it's not yet come, but now it has come, and it's on the scene, and soon you're going to see exactly where this conspiracy leads. And it's the worst news you could hear, but it's also the best news you've ever heard. And that's the beauty of all of this. So here we have just a short time in prophecy here for the other that is not yet come to come. And it is now here. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that, that uh, puts, puts prophecy into a, a time frame. So God wanted to, to put the explanation of 70 to 170 A.D. conspiracy, that conspiracy, He wanted to put it into a big picture where we could all understand it. And we have to get into the book of Revelation to understand it, and that's why God wanted John to write about it in the book of Revelation, which puts all prophecy into a time sequence. We must have that, and we must understand that. It's a beautiful understanding of Bible prophecy, and a most inspiring uh, prophecy indeed.
And our book on the United States and Britain and Prophecy talked to you about that. The New Throne of David discusses that. Daniel unlocks the book of Revelation booklet talks about that. All of our literature is free, and we'll explain all of these things to you. Revelation 17, verse 6 shows that the beast is drunk on the blood of God's saints. Well, what does that mean? The history was being blotted out, but then in 554 A.D. the first Holy Roman Empire began, and they had martyrs in that empire all the way down to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that includes the end time as well, this era, unless we repent of our sins. And but we need to understand what we're talking about here. You can see uh, there's a new defense minister about to appear in Germany. He has been appointed by Chancellor Olaf Scholz. That's in our news report. And he's put him in charge of the German armies and get it back on track the way it should be. This is a part of this Holy Roman Empire. And you need to understand that. But he just appointed a pro Russia defense minister at a crucial juncture in the Ukraine war. Olaf Scholz, the chancellor that did this, there's also the chance that Scholz just poured oil on the fire that was the defense ministry and could jeopardize his government. Could it jeopardize his government? He could, in other words, he's a weak chancellor and he could lose his government by doing this, allying himself with Russia when the Ukraine war is going on and everybody is accusing Germany of not doing enough the way it is. All of Europe has been criticizing them for not really helping the Ukraine. They've done very little. Why? Well, that's another story, and we'll tell you more about it as time goes on. There's been a lot going on between Germany and Russia, just like there was before World War II. They made a, a, a covenant with each other. And then immediately after that, Germany attacked Europe, the rest of Europe. So this weak chancellor is in, it could be in real trouble. But if you want to. Uh, Go, you can go into Daniel 8 and verse 11, and uh, 9 and 10, and there's an, an, another Antiochus talked about here. An Antiochus that has a lot of problems, and he does a lot of terrible things, and it says it's not by his own power. What, whose power is it? Well, it's the power of Satan the devil. And it's going to be terrible, the worst suffering ever, if we don't wake up and listen to God's message, Jesus Christ's message, and not a message about His person. We must do that. And I, he's talking about demon armies, and uh, here in Daniel 8, and, and angelic armies not being, uh, not being very effective because the people are transgressing. In verse 23 of Daniel 8, there's a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences. He's going to stand up because of the transgressors. He's going to stand up. Well, you can see that he's revealing all of these things about the uh, great conspiracy. And then verse 24 it goes on to say that he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. He's going to martyr God's lukewarm people in this end time, just as he done in the past. This is a great Antiochus. And then the next verse talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he's going to destroy this Holy Roman Empire forever. And he's going to rule this earth and bring peace and joy and happiness and all the prosperity you could imagine, and give this world all the hope that they could ever imagine. That's what's going to happen right on the heels of all these prophecies I talked to you about today. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. All of our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Request The Holy Roman Empire in Prophecy, Germany and the Holy Roman Empire, and The Holy Roman Empire is Back. Order now.
The preceding program was a paid presentation of the Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.